Welcome to the Brynamore Mission Area and the Sunday Devotional from Prestatin Church in Wales. This is the third Sunday of Advent and our theme today is Reasons to be Joyful. Our Bible reading is from the Old Testament prophet, one of the minor prophets, Zephaniah, chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. Sing, daughter of Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. 
I will rescue the lame, I will gather the exiles, I will give them praise and honour in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time I will gather you, at that time I will bring you home, I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reasons to be joyful. Well, the Old Testament prophet Zephaniah gives a lot of reasons to be joyful. Do you know Zephaniah? He's called one of the minor prophets just because it's a relatively short book, three chapters, but not because he has anything less important or worthy to say. Our passage is the jubilant end section of his book. So don't go thinking that the rest of it is like it because you'll be in for a shock. Most of the book is chastising and condemnation to say the least. In fact one writer calls it one of the most awesome descriptions of the wrath of God in judgment found anywhere in scripture. The totality of the cosmos shall be consumed in his burning anger. The very order of creation shall be overturned. But I think that makes it authentic to the time it was written, which was over 600 years before the birth of Jesus. At a time when Israel had been divided into two kingdoms, the north and the south, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And... There is some uncertainty about exactly when this was written, although it is set within the southern kingdom during the reign of King Josiah, which was 640 to 609 BC. And it was likely written a bit later because it addresses the whole of Israel at a time in which they had experienced great shame, subjugation, exile, and a really strong pagan influence that all that had all but robbed God of genuine and faithful followers. Now Josiah was made king when he was just eight years old, so hardly influential you might think. But 18 years later, f lost, forgotten, possibly forbidden scriptures were found hidden in the temple. And Josiah claimed them once more for his people and led the spiritual renewal of the nation. The scripture is thought to have included the book of Deuteronomy and highlighted sharp contrasts between the expectations upon God's people and the reality of the practices at that time. So in the condemnatory part of Zephaniah, God states, I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. So their status quo was challenged, that God was benign or indifferent and unlikely to judge, inconsequential and not prone to punishing. The penny dropped that their difficulties, the destruction of Jerusalem, their exile was all consequential to their lack of due consideration to God and their hypocrisy of on the one hand pledging loyalty to him, but then hedging their bets by turning to other gods as well. I wonder, are we really any different now? Are we not sometimes indifferent about God? Do we to worship other gods of our age as well as Jesus? Be that money, science, other philosophies? If Jesus returned today, yes, at the most inconvenient of times, perhaps when we're in the bath or we're just getting ready for bed or at our most fractious, do our actions at home match our faith commitments? That reminds me of a time when I was on a ferry uh, to the Isle of Man. Many of us were watching a film, Gandhi, a long film, and the boat docked part way through. How inconvenient, how badly planned, how frustrating that was. But do we live in a state of readiness 
that Jesus might return at the most inconvenient of times? Or do we think it doesn't really matter if we're ready or not, because God will not judge, not condemn, nor harm anyone for any reason? The writer Rebecca Manley Pippitt states this, We want to hear that our sin is not that serious, and that God isn't that concerned with it. The reality is that our sin is far worse than we could imagine, and that God in his holiness and love sees that our sin must be dealt with. We must face the severity of our sin if we have any chance of recovery. And we must see that God is not a sentimental God who thinks that sin is no big deal. And she goes on to comment, think how we feel when we see someone who is ravaged by unwise actions or relationships. Do we respond with benign tolerance uh, as we might towards strangers? Far from it. Anger isn't the opposite of love. Hate is. And the final form of hate is indifference. So that sort of helps us realise that God's anger is not a hateful expression, but born out of frustration towards those he loves. He then goes on to settle his own anger and sense of injustice through the actions of Jesus, which means that despite all those things, all that sin, God's entry into the world that we're looking forward to in celebrating at Christmas brings restoration and new life reasons to be joyful. We don't get what we deserve. So here, this good news of Jesus Christ, and uh, this is sometimes called the Gospel of Zephaniah, he has taken away our judgments and dealt with our enemies. So we find in this passage that Jerusalem, previously described as violent and an unfaithful city, is now depicted as a woman rejoicing in song. And where once they saw ruin as God abandoning his earthly home, now Zephaniah is reassuring the people, the Lord your God is in your midst. God's restorative presence brings joy that casts out fear. The restoration of justice, aid to the poor. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. God's presence brings a new way of relating to God and to one another. And we know that Jesus giving his life on the, Christ, on the cross is the contract signed in blood, the covenant that God will forgive and not punish the guilt of his people, because Jesus has taken that upon himself. The return of Jesus will be the fulfilment of it, as we shall then join the heavenly throng rejoicing in his presence. How remarkable when the passage declares that God himself rejoices over his people. Uh, Spurgeon commented on this, faulty as the church is, the Lord rejoices in her. Think of the great Jehovah singing. Can you imagine it? Is it possible to conceive of the deity breaking into a song? Father, Son and Holy Ghost together singing over the redeemed. And the commentator John Piper puts it this way. We must banish from our minds forever any thought that God admits us begrudgingly into his kingdom as though Christ found a loophole in the law, did some fancy plea bargaining and squeaked us by the judge. No way. God himself, the judge, put Christ forward, and when we trust him, God welcomes us with bells on. He puts a ring on our finger, kills the fatted calf, throws a party, shouts a shout that shakes the ends of creation, and leads in the festal dance. So reasons to be joyful, well, we have been forgiven and forgiven much, much more than we realise or acknowledge. 
We're joyful because God is faithful to us, living with us even when we ignore him. And a reason to be joyful is that God rejoices in us, singing over us. How can we not sing in response to him? He is undeterred in bringing us to our eternal home to be with him. Now these things can only ultimately be truly fulfilled because Jesus has accomplished them. So we celebrate the occasion of his first coming as we look towards Christmas and we wait expectant joyfully for his second. Let us pray. Father God, as we prepare during this Advent season to celebrate, help us to recognise all that we've been forgiven. Help us to be aware of the reality of sin in our lives and in the world around us. Father, thank you that you sent Jesus because you saw it was so wretched and so awful and so unholy. Much of it still is, but the, the cost of it, the price of it, Jesus sought it. And we can know that your desire to forgive is authentic and true and real. Father, thank you that you haven't given up on us, that you stick with us even during our dry periods when we don't seem to give you much attention, or when the world hurts us so much that we are just numb and can't offer words of worship or praise, at least not straight away. Thank you that you're there just being with us and holding us and comforting us. Thank you with that delightful awareness that you delight in us, that you sing over us, that when you see our hearts wanting to be forgiven, acknowledging in humility our failings and frailty, that you just warm to that and you delight in that. Thank you, Father, that you delight in all that you have made, even us. And so help us during this Advent to prepare not just to celebrate the birth of Jesus, but to look forward with renewed enthusiasm, joyfully for his return. Let's just spend a little time praying for those on our prayer board this week. And we also lift before God those who are grieving particularly the family and friends of Anne Evans, also of Yvonne Lawrence and Phyllis Jessen. Lord, we do ask your comfort and your strength, your support, your loving arms are wrapped around all who are grieving and hurting at this time. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Some notices for this week. Uh, this coming Friday and Saturday, there will be an extra uh, event of Deck the Halls. It will be on Saturday, though starting at one o'clock on Saturday. But because we missed out on one because of Storm Arwen, uh, we're going to 
add in an extra one on Friday the 17th, 10.30 to 3.30. So do come along. Do uh, see if there's any last minute gifts that you can find on all the stalls, the Good as New stall, um, and in, indeed some um, fresh decorations for the table that are being made that are very popular. Or indeed come and unwrap something if you're a child uh, that Father Christmas might give you. And then a reminder that CHS is supporting a food bank advent and bringing various items and popping them in different bags for different days in advent. So you can drop those off before or after the service, 9.30 on a Sunday, or on Wednesdays between 1 and 3 when the church is also open because there's a time of prayer and uh, activity, sort of work in the, the garden or in the building. So that's a good time to do that. If you haven't checked already, the uh, Brynamore Mission Area Facebook page has the pictures of the Advent windows that are all around the mission area. And uh, do just have a look and um, yeah, enjoy the various contributions that people have made. And if they're nearby, go and have a look in the flesh. I've been delighted at walking my dog of an evening. Um, some people have decorated windows or gardens in a, a really special way. In fact, here's um, a very simple one that I think is very powerful uh, in terms of how people use lights. And then in terms of um, an inspirational uh, religious theme, there aren't many of those, but here's one I rather liked. So uh, why not decorate your own windows and your own garden and uh, brighten up the neighbourhood with the light of Christ. Next Sunday there will be at 9.30 at the Church of the Holy Spirit a Holy Communion. At 10.45 an all-age service that will be in the parish community hall next to Christ Church because the church is cold. However we'll still be using the church for um, the nine lessons and carol service at six o'clock. And the Church of the Holy Spirit is having an extra service as well, carols and crafts at four o'clock. So that's a bit like Messy Church, but it just wanted to do something. Um, we'll be sat around tables. We won't move a great deal, but we'll have a sing and various crafts that will then be brought to the tables for us to enjoy together as families, or if you just like crafting, then come and uh, take part in that. Well, until next time, Keep safe, keep praying, and keep close to Jesus. Music